review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11pm, seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to those of you watching on TV and listening on DAB Radio. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Today we'll be providing you the latest on the war in Ukraine and a date for your diaries. Tuesday the 8th of March is International Women's Day, so ladies, do celebrate, but on Wednesday, mind, it's back to that kitchen. We'll ask the question, has feminism in 2022 gone too far? But first, the news with Olivia Guthrie. No comment. Good afternoon. It's two o'clock. I'm Olivia Guthrie in the GB newsroom. Evacuation efforts in a Ukrainian city have been halted as Russia reportedly ignores an agreed temporary ceasefire. Authorities in Mariupol say fighting is taking place in the Zaporizhia region, which is where the humanitarian corridor ends. The Ukrainian government says they had to plan to evacuate around 200,000 people from Mariupol and 15,000 from Volkano Volnovkovaka. The UK Foreign Office has advised British nationals in Russia whose presence is not essential to consider leaving the country. Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vereshuk says Russia is thwarting the evacuation plan by not observing the ceasefire. As you know, starting from 9 a.m., we had a preliminary agreement to create two humanitarian corridors in Volnovaka and Mariupol. I can confirm the fact that Russia violated the agreement in which the Red Cross was an intermediary. It did not fulfill undertaken duties and is shelling the town of Volnovaka. We call on the Russian side to stop shelling, restore ceasefire and allow columns to move along the humanitarian corridor so that children, women and elderly people can leave the towns. The number of refugees fleeing the Russian invasion could rise to 1.5 million by the end of the weekend. That's according to the head of the UN Refugee Agency. Currently, the figure stands at 1.3 million. They added that the, despite the possibility of humanitarian corridors, the situation remains dire with military action in many places across Ukraine. Speaking in Poland earlier, the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has announced further support. I'll support the needs of Ukrainians in Poland and other countries. Uh, the Biden administration just requested to Congress 2.5, uh, excuse me, 2.75 billion dollars in humanitarian assistance. Uh, that's both to meet the need of vulnerable people and communities inside Ukraine, uh, as well as to support refugee services, including here in Poland. The Ministry of Defence here says the rate of Russian air and artillery strikes in Ukraine has slowed in the last 24 hours. An intelligence briefing from the MOD reports Ukraine continues to hold on to the cities Kharkiv, Cherniv and Mariupol. There's also been street fighting in Sumy and authorities say it's highly likely all four cities are surrounded by Russian forces. Former NATO planner Philip Ingram told GB News Ukraine should brace itself for more aggression from Russia. The Ukrainians are much smaller, weaker force on paper, but with a real resolve that shows the, the human element of it, uh, are holding back the Russians. They, they, in military terms, they fixed them. The Russians haven't got the ability to manoeuvre and they stopped them achieving their objectives. The trouble is, historically, when the Russians don't get their objectives, they then start to go really nasty and um, we're in for the long game. 
Meanwhile, Russia has blocked access to Facebook for its citizens. The state regulator says the social media platform has been taken down for its discrimination against Russian media. Facebook Vice President of Global Affairs, Sir Nick Clegg, says Russians have been silenced from speaking out. A Formula One team has sacked its Russian driver following the country's invasion of Ukraine. Nikita Mazepin's contract has been terminated by the American-owned team Haas. He says he will not race in Formula One this season. The team also ended its deal with Russian sponsor Ural Kali, owned by Mr Mazepin's father. Here in the UK, a 40-year-old man has appeared in court via video link on suspicion of stabbing his divorced parents to death. William Warrington is charged with the murder of 67-year-old Clive Warrington and 73-year-old Valerie. On Wednesday, Mr Warrington was found dead in Cheltenham and later that day, Mrs Warrington's body was discovered in a village 15 miles away. The defendant was remanded into custody ahead of a hearing at Bristol Crown Court on March the 8th. Australian cricket star Shane Warne had been experiencing chest pains prior to his death in Thailand, according to police in the country. The 52-year-old also reportedly had a medical history of asthma and some heart issues. It's been announced the Great Southern Stand at Melbourne Cricket Ground is going to be named after the leg spinner. And Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has offered Mr Warne's family a state funeral. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now back to Darren. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, live on your telly and DAB radio. Here's what's coming up on the show. We'll be bringing you the latest on the invasion of Ukraine. Russian forces continue to shell the Ukrainian city of Mariupol today, despite agreeing to a ceasefire just hours earlier, throwing an attempted mass evacuation of civilians into chaos. But we'll also be looking at the role China have, if any, in ending this war. We'll be asking why aren't they putting sanctions on Russia and do they have a role to play in ending the war. Also, the 8th of March is International Women's Day, which to me begs the question, has feminism gone too far? Is it really needed in today's society? We'll be debating that question shortly. Today's instalment of Scrap Reform Keep will see us putting the energy price cap through its paces. From next month, the price cap will increase by nearly 700 quid. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts, though. Has feminism gone too far? You can tweet me at GB News or you can email me on GBviews at GB News UK. You can watch her online too on YouTube and don't forget about Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content on the GB News page until Nick Clegg takes it down. Cheers very much. Well, hey folks, since I was last on air, it feels like the world has absolutely gone to hell in a handcart. We're on the second week of Putin's invasion of Ukraine and continue to receive a painfully slow feed of news on the advancement of Russian forces towards Ukraine's capital, Kiev. And during his State of the Union address, we've seen President Biden accidentally say he stands with the Iranian people, with his Vice President Kamala Harris appearing to mouth the word Ukrainian, clearly recognising the cock-up just made. In another interview this week, he said Putin had decided he's going to invade Russia, proving, folks, that while the White House might be the most luxurious retirement home, in the world. It turns out it's no longer the House of Lords. We've seen the complete trashing of, uh, the, uh, frankly, the legacy of Angela Merkel. The 16 long years she's been chan or was Chancellor of Germany, often hailed as a bastion of liberalism in Europe, only to have ushered in an era of reliance upon Russia, stupidly, naively, moronically allowing a pipeline to connect the two nations economically. We're now about to witness the painful untangling of the what Angela Merkel has done between those two nations. And speaking of gas folks, 
Well, God, we've been talking about that quite a lot. We've seen European gas prices hit record highs, yet the government still won't countenance making use of the rich seam that's under our feet. A golden opportunity, if you ask me, that's been royally squandered in not exploiting that high quality gas that we know is there. Meanwhile, Americans can still keep their gas prices low because of the shale gas revolution that took place under President Obama and Trump. The cost of natural gas in Europe, folks, is a whopping 13 times, 13 times, unlucky for some, certainly for Europeans, 13 times more than what the Yanks are paying. At least we're listening to teenage truant Greta Thunberg and her clan on energy policy over common sense politics, eh? The zealots of the Remain cause told us that Britain would also be smaller, isolated and mean-spirited post-Brexit. The one thing that this horrendous war has shown were, with crystal clarity in my view, is how very wrong they were. I actually feel, I don't know about you, but I feel immensely proud of the British response and the leadership that we've actually shown in our response to Russian brutality. The Ukrainian military views Britain as its strongest proponent. We've trained 20,000 snipers, and our training on how to use those anti-tank missiles have proven invaluable in the defence of Ukraine. But I've said it before and I'll repeat it now. This war, the threat of nuclear holocaust, the sky-high bills as a consequence of weaning Europe off of Putin's gas, and of course the tragic loss of life, including that of civilians, has called into question the self-indulgent, narcissistic, self-loathing that activists in Britain have obsessed over in recent years. Now, to me, one such event that's coming up on Tuesday, folks, it's International Women's Day, a chance for groups that like to paint a picture of women as being nothing other than victims in modern Britain to get together and tell us just how rotten men are. Now, folks, I was brought up exclusively by women, and let me tell you, the two of them responsible for bringing me up are anything but victims of life or wider society. And actually, I think the message from the two of them would be that we don't need to convince boys that masculinity is toxic. We don't need to teach boys that their sex means they're naturally evil. We don't need to persuade boys that they're just intrinsically a threat to women. Society needs more men like me late granddad, for example, a man who fought for his country, worked down the pits, then as a plumber, raising five kids, doing it all whilst remaining well-dressed, smart and tidy, polite, and an all-round decent bloke and heroic granddad. We need more men like that who won't leave women when they're going gets tough, who won't flee once a baby's on the scene. We need to create resilient men that don't waste their lives playing video games in their boxer shorts. We need to recognise that celebrating the difference between men and women isn't altogether a bad thing. We need to drop this narrative around toxic masculinity. Because I tell you what, folks, until we do, I reckon we'd be pretty hard pressed to win any war where the Russians or the Chinese to catch that Eurostar over the channel and invade these shores. But what do you think? Has the whole equalities agenda and the feminist movement gone too far? Or do you think I'm talking complete rubbish and women do have it pretty tough in modern life? <laughs>But first, folks, an update on that war between Russia and Ukraine. The Ukrainian government say that they plan to evacuate around 200,000 people. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the Kremlin's actions are an abomination and the world is turning its back on Moscow. One thing I want to discuss today is China, who are a close political ally of Russia. So what role do they have, if any, when it comes to stopping this war. Gordon Chang is the author of the great US-China tech war and the coming collapse of China. And he joins me now. Gordon, what role do you think China potentially have in ending this war? We're starting to see China really, I think, in, uh, insert itself as, frankly, the superpower of the world. Well, Darren, uh, China's financing uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This became clear on February 4th with the announcement of $117.5 billion in new oil and gas deals, 
there's been an announcement of a coal deal, 100 million metric tons. China has removed the uh, restrictions on the importation of Russian wheat recently. This is putting money into Vladimir Putin's hands. That allows him to take apart Ukraine. So, yes, if we were to sanction China, we were to give China some incentives, yeah, China could actually tell Putin to stop it. But until we impose those costs on Beijing, I don't believe that China is going to do anything constructive. Yeah, do you actually think that what the, the West's response so far, bearing in mind the, I think, quite united Frank, uh, front, I've been quite proud of that, actually, the way in which we've all got together and said, well, actually, we're not going to stand for this, and Russia has received some pretty, has to be said, stringent sanctions. Do you think that China will be looking at the way in which the West has responded to the invasion of Ukraine and saying, well, actually, I feel a lot happier about our prospects in Taiwan? There, there are a couple things going on here, Darren. First of all, um, there was a massive failure of deterrence. And you can be proud of Britain, but I cannot be proud of the way that President Biden failed to stop Russia from invading Ukraine. We had the power to do it. Our economy is 13.5 times bigger than Russia's. Your economy is two times bigger than Russia. EU's economy is 10.1 times bigger than Russia, and yet we failed to do it. But as you point out, after the invasion, the response from the West has been um, superb. Um, more we can do, um, but nonetheless, we are having an effect. China will look at this, though, and I think the one thing it'll take away, the most important thing it'll take away, is that the Ukrainian people are stopping a much larger power. In China's view of the world, big powers get to do what they want. They probably thought Russian armor would take over the country in two days. And that means the people in Taiwan now are going to mount a stiffer response. And that is going to deter Beijing. Mm. We also found out that China won't be broadcasting any Premier League matches. Now, the Premier League, as you well know, is actually a great bang for Britain's book, right? We actually create a lot of revenue around the world. It's an immensely popular football league. Now, what do you actually make of that move? Do you think that we're going to start to see more of this sort of censorship from China because it wants to actually tone down the, the, the prospects of Ukraine having a robust defence against Russian aggression? Yeah, that comes in the context of two things. First of all, um, Beijing support for Russia, um, but also um, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has been closing off Chinese society from the world. He's been removing foreign influence. He's been trying to promote state enterprises over domestic Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, he believes in a strong Chinese culture. And that means, in his view, um, as few uh, Western influences, or foreign influences for that matter, as possible. So this is a very bad sign because throughout Chinese history, through millennia, whenever China tried to close itself off from the world, disaster for the Chinese people followed. And Xi Jinping, when he sees that disaster, could lash out in order to blame foreigners. Yeah. I, I, China have yet to actually condemn Russia or anything like that. And as you say, I, I, I mean, I really doubt that that's going to happen, right? I won't hold my breath or I don't think I've lasted very long. <laughs> Yesterday, China's foreign ministry <laughs> urged all sides to actually ensure the safety of nuclear facilities in Ukraine after the, the biggest on, in Europe came under fire. Will China actually be concerned about Russia's nuclear arsenal? Or do you think actually... Because, of course, Russia marching into Ukraine before that, China made it quite clear that there wasn't a threat or going to be a threat from China at the other side of the border. So do you actually see the two? Will that alliance work out in the long term, you reckon? Well, in the long term, I don't think so. They've got uh, conflicting interests. But um, I'm not worried about what the Chinese and Russians think of each other a century from now. I'm worried about what they're doing now. And China's support for um, Vladimir Putin is strong. You know, Darren, we hear a lot of mid-level, a lot of low-level Chinese officials express concern that Beijing's position is not in China's interest. And that's right. Um, but at the top, Xi Jinping, where it counts, and he's about the only guy who counts for many things, he's fully behind uh, Vladimir Putin. So um, we shouldn't be diverted by what uh, sensical, sensible people at the bottom of the Chinese political system think. 
because they really don't have a voice in setting China's external policies. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for that insight. Gordon Chang, their author of The Great U.S.-China Tech War and the Common Collapse of China. Thanks for speaking to me today. Now, this week it was announced that MPs will get a 2,200 quid pay rise on April 1st. That's no joke, folks. This means their basic salary will go up to £84,000 a year. Not bad work if you can get it. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Labour leader Sakia Starmer have both said that MPs shouldn't get a pay rise. But... They will. At a time, let's not forget, when the government is hiking taxes for the rest of work. Now, I tweeted out, if MPs want to take their pay rise, they ought to cancel the tax hike that they're proposing to inflict on the rest of work. This prompted a response from many of you. Naomi said that their independent pay committee has made another poor decision. It might be best to disband the committee and lock that office door. Lance tweeted too, saying it would be good if civil servants and politicians were paid a basic and a bonus based on the success of the economy and level of debt. Not a bad idea. On the other hand, Lloyd said, why are MPs not allowed a pay rise? I have one pretty much every year when I was working. Well, wherever Lloyd is working or was working, I'd like to work there too. Whereas Ben tweeted, what's always annoying me about MPs giving themselves a pay rise? Aren't they supposed to be public servants? Surely it's us, the public, the people who put them there, who should decide if they merit an increase. Well, food for thought there, folks. Also, lots of you commenting on Facebook. Melvin said, one thing we can be sure of, no matter what taxation increases, our political and state elites will never feel the chill winds coming from the glacier of poverty. Beautifully put. Colin commented, they have the nerve to scrap the triple lock pay increase for pensioners who will now struggle and they want to give themselves a pay rise. Many pensioners, of course, choosing between Heaton and Eaton. And finally, Andrew said, the salary is very small compared to senior public servants. I think you need to have half as many politicians and pay them twice as much. What do you think? Does your local MP deserve a pay rise? Give me a shout out on GB News or email gbviews at gbnews.uk. And I mentioned a few comments on Facebook a moment ago. Don't forget to give the GB News page a like on Facebook. Plenty of great content on there. Now... Still to come this afternoon on Real Britain, we'll be discussing whether or not feminism has gone too far. But first, let's have a little look at that weather. Looking at... Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry and clear for many away from eastern and central England. Let's take a look at those details. Zooming into the southwest, and it will be a fine end to the day. It will turn chilly, though, once the sun goes down as skies remain clear. Moving east, and it will be a cloudy and damp evening across southeast England and east Anglia. Winds will be brisk, especially along the coast. We move back into the clear skies across Wales this evening with just a little cloud across the hills and mountains. Far west of the Midlands will also see clear skies this evening, but elsewhere it will be rather cloudy. The cloud will be thick enough in places to give some rain. Northern England, however, will see a dry and fine evening with any cloud and showers generally easing away. It will lead to a chilly start to the night, though with a frost quickly developing. There will be a few showers still in the north of Scotland, otherwise it will be dry and clear this evening, leading to a cold end to the day. It will also be chilly in Northern Ireland as the sunshine gives way to clear skies this evening. Winds will be light, leading to the odd fog patch forming. Overnight, we'll see the clearest and coldest weather in the north, whereas further south will be cloudier, but temperatures staying above freezing here. That's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. I oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. The time is 2.25. Now let's hear from some real voices. We've been to Wimbledon to ask if you think that feminism has gone too far. It's not gone too far at all. It hasn't even started, actually. We're, we're underrepresented in main areas of the workforce. We're not treated the same. And uh, when it comes to work and ba work-life balance, we're doing all the childcare as well. If there's a bit of like mutual understanding and respect, that probably go, longer, go a longer way than just shouting an ideology down people's throats and, and maybe that would help. But yeah, no, there's definitely a cause to be had. So um, yeah, I support that. No, I don't think things are equal. I think um, they're just on the spec of hopefully in coming years to become equal. Like anything, it takes time and you continuously need to push for more. The moment you stop, the moment things start to go backwards. Where do I think it's gone too far? I mean, I think maybe this is controversial to say in the, in the modern environment, but men and women on average do have different personalities we are different and because it doesn't mean that there's not a big crossover because there is a big crossover but like different personality traits that tend to be concentrated in women and different personality traits that tend to be concentrated in men can mean that men and women choose different career paths for example so it's very difficult to reach a point of equality in some career areas because some careers attract women some careers attract men Interesting thoughts there, people in Wimbledon given their opinion on whether or not feminism has gone too far or indeed is needed at all in 2022. So with International Women's Day taking place on Tuesday, I wanted to focus my culture raw debate today on whether or not feminism has indeed gone too far or if it is actually needed. Here to debate this, I'm joined by Kelly J. Keane, the founder of Standing for Women, and Mike Buchanan, the leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. Now, Mike, in 30 seconds, has feminism gone too far? Feminism has, has, has always gone too far. The, 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 the idea that women are an oppressed class is an absolute joke. They're a highly privileged class. And feminism today exists simply, well, for the reason it's always existed, to extend female privilege over men. And there are just so many areas where, 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 where women are privileged. I, you know, I, I defy Kelly J to tell me one area where, where, where women are oppressed uh, in Britain today. Kelly J, I assume that your position would be that if we look at the debate around women's rights and women to access to single sex spaces and issues like this, that actually women 
are facing a threat in that respect? A hundred percent. Look, this this existential threat to women, uh, including our language, our spaces and so on, is happening to women. I don't see that that makes us an overprivileged uh, class. I think it's I think it's utterly mistaken to suggest that women and men are totally the same, that our lives should be totally the same. Of course, they're not. But um, yeah, in 2022, I don't think feminism is fit for purpose because many people who call themselves feminists actually include men who call themselves women as women. So uh, yeah, I think feminists um, need to maybe rebrand uh, if they actually care about women and women's rights. Um, I certainly think, I think, I think feminism it, sorry, sorry. Is, is a much better word that talks about females. I think yes. it's about time for the fifth wave of feminism, the wave goodbye. Well, but Mike, right. how, well, are, they, how right. are women privileged in, in modern life? Uh, in, in, in so many areas. I mean, if you just take healthcare, for example, um, there are, there are two national screening programs for cancer, breast cancer and cervical cancer. More men die of prostate cancer than die of breast cancer. There's not even any discussion about there being a national screening program for men. men uh, males have been disadvantaged in the education system since 1987. Um, so, so today, something like 55, no, something like 60% of students are female. Um, wherever you look, I mean, women have protection against genital mutilation. Males do. Males have no protection against uh, genital mutilation. You know, women, where are the campaigns, women, though? Women, where are the campaigns for that? Because obviously women, the reason women's health care is very much considered is women worked really hard to get those uh, health care needs up front and center. So maybe men should do the same. I think it's absolutely quite right. If but, prostate cancer but, but is the biggest killer there's a killer reason for that, Kelly J. The men, reason is women, then, sorry, women I can't push at an open door. Um, so, sorry, if prostate say, cancer women are pushing is really serious, open then door. men surely point, should like, raise a campaign. Yeah, just say that again, Kelly J. We missed that ever so slightly. Well, look, I think prostate cancer seriously is, uh, is is a killer of men, and I don't understand why there isn't more of a push to do screening. But that doesn't mean that women <laughs> women are privileged. It means that we fought really hard to get those campaigns front and, and Kelly, centre do, for do women. You, do you for think being... that ultimately a nice society, the kind of society that I'd like to see, is one where we don't actually have this relentless focus on the issue of identity? I think that explains what you campaign heart and soul over at the minute, which is the protection of single sex spaces. There was access to single sex spaces. When you have someone like J.K. Rowling being dismissed as some kind of bigot for arguing as a woman who survived a domestic abuse in, in, the, in the home in the past, to actually argue for access to those single sex spaces, being derided for doing so. Isn't that just because we are doing this, we are focusing on identity and making identity king? Shouldn't we get away from all of that? Well, it's very yeah, easy to say that, Darren. There, but there, there are, there are, are, I'll let you come back. Okay, Joseph. The, 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 the reason that, 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 um, that, that you know, there, there, there is no traction on, on male... Let, let's let's say on prostate cancer is because priority is always given to females. So it's all very well saying women have fought for this or fought for that, but women are pushing at an open door. I've, I've I've been campaigning with others to bring about an end to male genital mutilation, which is a crime in this country, and I'm not even permitted to bring out a private prosecution. Well, Mike, I also think that you raise a very important point on, for example, working class boys. They are disadvantaged as far as education is concerned. It's an important point, but I don't think, Kelly J, again, I go back to that point. I don't think that segregating us and separating us on all kinds of things like identity based, immutable characteristics is one that I think is laudable. Well, no, you see that, but I Kelly point that we, we live that, Mike. Mike, if you can let Kelly J just answer that question. Look, it's absolutely preposterous. There are differences between men and women. These are fundamental biological differences. And I think it would be ridiculous to suggest that my biological makeup doesn't in some way shape my cultural experience, right? To then say that that can just be worn and adopted, I think is, is horrendously offensive. And that particular assault 
is happening more to women than it is to men. Like, we can't even say a woman is an adult human female without being accused of using a transphobic dog whistle. So on that level, I don't think this could happen if we were this wonderfully overprivileged, well-considered and centered class of people. So I think just on that basis, uh, that's rather silly. Um, but, you know, feminists are also championing this. So I really have no traction with, with modern day feminism at all. Yeah, so Mike then, how will you be celebrating International Women's Day? <laughs> the way I always do. Right, which is? By ignoring it completely. It's uh, Kelly J, how will you be celebrating International Women's Day? Oh, I probably will have a lovely glass of wine, um, ensuring that the members of Standing for Women have some fabulous discounts. Uh, that's probably what I'm going to do. Well, Kelly J. Keane and Mike Buchanan, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. You're with GB News on telly and DAB Radio. Still to come, we'll be going back to basics on Swift and we'll be putting the energy price cap through scrap, reform or keep before 3 p.m. Now it's time for a check on those news headlines with Olivia Guthrie. Thank you, Darren. It's 2.34. I'm Olivia Guthrie in the GB newsroom. Evacuation efforts in the Ukrainian cities of Mariupol and Volnovaka have been halted as Russia reportedly ignores an agreed temporary ceasefire. That's according to the Red Cross. Ukrainian authorities say fighting is taking place in the Zaporizhia region, which is one of the which is where one of the humanitarian corridors ends. Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vereshuk says Russia is thwarting the evacuation plan by not observing a ceasefire. As you know, starting from 9 a.m., we had a preliminary agreement to create two humanitarian corridors in Volnovaka and Mariupol. I can confirm the fact that Russia violated the agreement in which the Red Cross was an intermediary. It did not fulfill undertaken duties and is shelling the town of Volnovaka. We call on the Russian side to stop shelling, restore ceasefire and allow columns to move along the humanitarian corridor so that children, women and elderly people the number of refugees fleeing the Russian invasion could rise to 1.5 million by the end of the weekend. That's according to the head of the UN Refugee Agency. Currently, the figure stands at 1.3 million. It added that despite the possibility of humanitarian corridors, the situation remains dire, with military action in many places across Ukraine. Australian cricket star Shane Warne had been experiencing chest pains prior to his death in Thailand, according to the police in the country. The 52-year-old also reportedly had a medical history of asthma and some heart issues. It's been announced the Great Southern Stand at Melbourne Cricket Ground is going to be named after the leg spinner. And Australia Prime Minister Scott Morrison has offered Mr Warne's family a state funeral. TV online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes after this short break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. 
and we hope you can join us for Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, the European Union, the US and UK and allies around the world have excluded a number of Russian banks from something called SWIFT. The move aims to hit the country's banking network as SWIFT helps with the smooth transaction of money worldwide. But what exactly is it and what exactly will it do? Vicky Price is the Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economics and Business Research and former government advisor. Vicky, could you just explain in layman's terms, please, what actually SWIFT is? It's very interesting. It's like a cooperative, if you like. It stands for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Communications, and it is really what it says in the title. So it is communications. It's a messaging system owned by the banks that are members of it um, and paying for it. Basically, it allows for transactions to take place quite easily and efficiently and securely. So all the banks that are members of this, there are something like 11,000 um, financial institutions that use SWIFT, mm. um, they are able to make transactions very quickly and very securely. So you send a message and the transaction then happens. You don't have to test an awful lot of other things before that transaction is allowed. So it's very efficient, cuts down costs and allows cross-border payments to be much easier than would otherwise have been the case. Yeah, so, so how unprecedented is this move then? Is every, you know, dodgy regime around the world allowed to access SWIFT? Is this pretty unprecedented? It's pretty unprecedented that uh, we have taken a number of banks out of that system. But of course, remember, we're talking about seven banks in Russia. There are 330 uh, banks in, in uh, Russia at present. So it's a small percentage, if you like, of them, even though they're quite significant banks. And we have left a couple of quite big banks still operating through the SWIFT system. And that is mainly because a lot of countries still need to be paying for their gas and oil that they get from Russia. There are other systems. So China has developed its own, it's called SIPS, and even uh, Russia has developed its own system. But for the moment, there are fewer financial institutions that are members of those two systems. So SWIFT is definitely the biggest. Right. And then Russia is sat there, you know, President Putin saying, well, hang on, folks, I've got absolutely ginormous currency reserves. We can we can shield ourselves from this blow. Is that right? Or will this really, really impact everyday Russians? It is already impacting everyday Russians because in addition, of course, you've had lots of restrictions imposed by Barclay card, as far as I understand it, and Visa. So there is a problem there in terms of being able to access some of the accounts that people have and make transactions. So that's another issue. Plus, uh, you know, Apple in terms of the way in which you can use your mobile phones to pay uh, has also affected Russians negatively. So there are big issues there. Um, of course, what the government has done in uh, Russia has been to use those reserves that you mentioned. The estimate is that there is something like 650 billion worth in dollars of reserves that the Russian central bank has. A lot of those, of course, are kept in foreign currency and are also abroad, and those have been frozen. So that is, in fact, possibly one of the most effective sanctions that we've got against Russia at present. But remember, we're still buying a lot of its oil because there are ways of bypassing the SWIFT system in particular. It's not just the other 
um, possibilities that I mentioned, the other t systems that exist, but it's also possible to just do it through using a different messaging system. You can transfer money by using your WhatsApp messaging system uh, and direct one bank to transfer money to another. It will cost uh, a little bit more, but you can do it. You can pay in cash, you can right, buy yes. rubles possibly, and so on. Yeah. So why were Germany, France and Italy initially, why was it seen or actually predicted that they would be reluctant to take action against Russia on SWIFT? Is that because of the intertwining of the economies of those nations and Russia? Absolutely. I think the main thing is, of course, uh, the fact that they're very dependent on Russian gas. In particular, I think uh, if we look at the latest data, certainly the, the data pre-pandemic, uh, we saw that Germany was relying on over 50 percent of its gas inputs from uh, what was coming on in the pipelines from Russia and Italy about 46 percent. The interesting thing is that the UK doesn't only about 5 percent and a lot of our gas that we import comes from Norway. So we were a lot less affected. So they were worried that that flow of gas and oil uh, would be diminished very significantly if they imposed they, by which I mean Germany, Italy and others. Uh, whereas France relies a lot on nuclear energy, so it doesn't rely very much at all on, on Russian imports. Uh, but they have agreed to this for those seven banks. But as I suggested, there's still the ability to pay for those um, mm -hmm. gas and oil imports. And that has been carrying on. And Germany has said just yesterday that it does not intend to block that flow anyway, because it's worried about the implications for its economy if it did. Right, yeah. So, Vicky, if I can just ask you finally, I know you're not a clairvoyant, but I am going to ask you to play the role of Mystic Meg right now. Do you actually think that the Russians will ever be back on SWIFT? Who ultimately will make that decision? Well, the, the various countries that have intervened and got them out of the system will have to agree to this again. And what is happening, in fact, right now is that there are extra sanctions being contemplated and imposed. And what we've also heard is now we're beginning to see tariffs on Russian exports. We're seeing also um, blocking of oil exports to mm -hmm. places like Canada, which has stopped buying from. So I think uh, it's going to take quite some time before they can return. And I think what they'll be doing is they will be developing their own system and hope for the best. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for that insight there. That's Vicky Price clearing up what SWIFT is for me on Real Britain this afternoon. It's now 2.45 and time for scrap, reform or keep. And bills are going up, aren't they? Every bill that you open is going up because of the energy price cap next month. The maximum price suppliers can actually charge in England and Wales and Scotland it, that's going up and up and up. It's 54% that bills can actually be increased by when this new cap is introduced. Malcolm Grimston is a senior research fellow at the Centre for Energy Policy and Tech at Imperial College, and he joins me now. Malcolm, is it your view that actually the price cap is shielding consumers and ensuring that these, you know, what we assume will be oil barons and all the rest of it, can't actually rip off consumers? I, that's certainly the intention behind it. I think the, the problem with it is that uh, the energy market is layered. And so there's one layer that produces electricity and gas and oil. There's another layer that supplies it into our homes, and we have the direct relationship as customers. And there's a level in between which carries the uh, electricity or gas or oil or whatever it is from the one to the other. Uh, now, the middle one is a natural monopoly. It would make no sense to build a second national grid and have people saying, well, I'll use that national grid because it's slightly cheaper than this one. The capital costs would be ridiculous. And there you need price caps. You need regulated prices. So the companies operating in a monopoly can't rip us all uh, off. So to that extent, price caps certainly have their place. If you've got competition, which is working, though, then price caps become rather peculiar. We don't have a price cap on the cost of milk in our supermarkets, say, because I don't have to go to one supermarket that's charging more or is sourcing its milk from areas I don't like or whatever. I can go to another supermarket. So there's no need for a price cap. And the difficulty is that where we've, what we've seen recently is that the price cap for the suppliers has been deadly. 
the gas price has shot up. They're having to pay more for the gas they're going to pass on to us consumers and electricity to an extent, but they're not allowed to increase the prices to us at the same time. So they have to go bust. There's no yeah. other logical possibility. Exactly. And we know that it's basic economics, right? The more competition you have, the better prices you're going to be able to receive on the marketplace. But And the irony, it, the irony there is that the price cap is driving companies out of business, so reducing the amount of competition. Exactly, exactly. And wouldn't you argue, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I wasn't very old at the time, but in the 90s, couldn't you argue that actually competition within the energy market was quite a success story? It's variable if you go around the world. In the UK, uh, we did move away from a time when we were dominated by uh, domestically mined coal, very powerful trade unions, which meant that we didn't get always get the most uh, uh, efficient uh, decision taking in energy. That uh, monopoly was broken up by competition, and for some time prices began to uh, come down. Uh, and so uh, there are other areas of the world where that wasn't as clear. And I think the general consensus is that competition doesn't make all that much difference. But certainly if you have, uh, th there's a balance in energy between security of supply and cost. Mm. When you have very little competition or monopolies, you get the security fabulous. You invest in loads of things. But many people felt maybe we were gold plating security at the expense of cost. Markets kind of push the other way. They run things very efficiently. They're very focused on cost. Maybe from time to time, we need to just nudge the market to make sure that we have secure supply so we have enough new investment going in. The other difficulty with price caps is that you're in effect, and this is more, even more the case with windfall taxes, it seems to me, is that you're telling companies, you know, invest if you want to, but we are never going to let you make a reasonable a profit. profit. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that's the problem, Malcolm. So then with that said, would you actually argue that we need to scrap, reform or keep the price cap in place? I think like most academics, I'm pretty much on the fence. There are reforms uh, reform. because there are areas where it's essential. But I think I'd probably go for reform. Uh, and if I was pushed, I'd go on the scrap side of reform. Well, Malcolm, I tell you what, I think we could power the nation using my blood pressure every time I open one of those bills. Senior Research Fellow, thank you very much for your time this afternoon, Malcolm. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch today about whether or not feminism has gone too far after listening to Kelly J and Mike Buchanan argue it out earlier. Now, Robert says, to paraphrase a Special Forces Royal Marine poet, why are women beaten on the door when they only have to turn the handle? Modify that if you can't push the door open, try pulling. Gwen says, how can you suggest feminism has gone too far? Women are paid less for doing the same jobs as men. We're generally worried about travelling home on a night out and we're judged for our clothing and lifestyle choices on a daily basis. Well, I tell you what, Ped, I think if I turned up in a T-shirt, there'd be plenty of views to arguing online that I look like a scruffy so-and-so, but hey oh. Since when is that fair, she says, if men had to be women for the day, that they would definitely have a different appreciation of us. Controversial stuff. Richard says, yes, it's gone too far. If we're to have equity, let's have equality for all. What about areas where men are underrepresented? What about the gender studies department? Why not positive discrimination for men there? Well, I tell you what, Richard, all you need to do these days is self-identify. You can be whatever you want to be these days. Sean says, what happened to feminism where women can do everything men can do? Turning single fathers away from the Ukraine border crossings is wrong. The media in the UK is unsurprisingly silent on the issue of men and boys being expected to fight whilst women and girls are not. Are our men and boys of less value than women and girls? Another controversial comment, food for thought there. Now, on a campus clash, is it ever justifiable, folks, to bomb foreign countries. We've seen what's happened in Iraq, Yemen, and is it ever right and justifiable? I'm joined now, delighted to say, I'm joined by Amir Duabi. He's an economics graduate at Durham and a law school student. Ella Carmichael, a politics student in Durham. You are both in Durham, after my heart, I tell you. So in 30 seconds each, is it ever justifiable to bomb foreign countries. Amaya, I'll start with you first, if you don't mind. 
Yes, definitely. So my first argument would be that civilian casualties are definitely not acceptable in the 21st century. Afghanistan is an example of that. Um, we've had a uh, bombing in the last few months where a U.S. missile strike killed 10 civilians, including seven children. So technology isn't really helping there. Um, the second would be bombing for peace is counterintuitive. It's like starving yourself if you're hungry, but it satisfies the purpose. So it doesn't really make any sense. Um, and thirdly, I would say we've come a long way since the Second World War. Uh, peaceful negotiations um, have come a long way and peace talks have come a long way. So there should be a better way to resolve issues than to resort to bombing. Thank you very much. Ella? Yeah, so I think the first thing to acknowledge is that bombing a foreign country is never an ideal situation, but I think that everything comes down to being kind of a rational cost-benefit analysis when you're making a political decision. So I think that, <clears throat> firstly, if a country is perpetuating human rights abuses, so for example, Syria, when um, the our parliament voted to intervene a few years ago, you know, it's a analysis and a trade-off as to whether it's better to save more lives and sacrifice a few, which obviously sounds awful on the face of things. But I think that that's kind of the crux of the issue. And also, you know, because of the international responsibility to protect, states are expected to intervene in affairs if a state can't look after their own people and are perpetuating human rights abuses. So Ella, so in your like, view then, if we take World War II as an example, we bombed, yeah. we, there was a constant attrition of bombing in Germany to try and weaken German morale and ensure that things like cutting off our food supply and other really, really quite serious issues weren't attempted over the English Channel and in between America and the United Kingdom. If we consider that, for example, wasn't it right to bomb and make life tough for the German people? Well, yes, I think definitely. And I think that in such large international conflicts such as this, there is certainly an argument to be able to bomb foreign countries in those circumstances, like what you've just demonstrated. Amaya, is, is that, do you agree with those sentiments? Do you actually think that, you know, if we bomb countries and there is uh, intervention in those countries, that actually you do end up ultimately bringing about peace? Um, so it starts with the cost-benefit analysis um, argument that was put forward. So the first question would be who decides who's the person who's going to, which country feels like they're the authority to kind of have a cost-benefit analysis. Russia's argument has been that there's been violations in Ukraine, human rights violations in um, the separatist states, and that's why they've been intervening. So that's their argument, and that's the self-defense argument. And the self-defense argument, cost-benefit analysis, has been used time and time again, and it hasn't been very effective. Um, so my question is... Well, folks, decides? thank you very much. That's that's all we've got time for. Amaya and Ella, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. You have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. The show's on every Saturday and Sunday at 2pm. But for now, I'm going to leave you with that weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry and clear for many away from eastern and central England. Let's take a look at those details. Zooming into the southwest, and it will be a fine end to the day. It will turn chilly, though, once the sun goes down as skies remain clear. Moving east, and it will be a cloudy and damp evening across southeast England and east Anglia. Winds will be brisk, especially along the coast. We move back into the clear skies across Wales this evening, with just a little cloud across the hills and mountains. Far west of the Midlands will also see clear skies this evening, but elsewhere it will be rather cloudy. The cloud will be thick enough in places to give some rain. Northern England, however, will see a dry and fine evening with any cloud and showers generally easing away. It will lead to a chilly start to the night, though with a frost quickly developing. There will be a few showers still in the north of Scotland, otherwise it will be dry and clear this evening, leading to a cold end to the day. It will also be chilly in Northern Ireland as the sunshine gives way to clear skies this evening. Winds will be light, leading to the odd fog patch forming. Overnight, we'll see the clearest and coldest weather in the north, whereas further south will be cloudier, but temperatures staying above freezing here. That's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This 